When I sent over the audio this week to Bill Munson, uh, you noticed maybe last week that he was able to sync up the audio with the with this movie, the Gospel of uh, the Gospel of John. And so he did that again this week. Uh, the movie's all in Aramaic, so he uh, has a nice way of being able to put the voices of Faith Lutheran alongside the scene being acted out, and let this really hit home as we hear the reading from John nine. Jesus saw a man blind from birth. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes. Go, wash in the pool. The man washed and was able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said it was. No, but it is someone like him. Yes, it's me. I'm the man. Then how were your eyes opened? The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to the pool and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. Where is he? I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees on the Sabbath the man who had formerly been blind, and they asked how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes and I washed. Now I see. This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? They were divided, so they asked what he thought about Jesus. He is a prophet. They still did not believe, so they called in his parents. Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said he's of age because they were afraid, for the Pharisees had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. They called the the man who'd been blind back. Give glory to God. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. How did he open your eyes? I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but we do not know where this man comes from. Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. It's never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? They drove him out, but Jesus found him. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. You have seen him. I am he. Lord, I believe. I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Surely we are not blind, are we? If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see, Your sin remains. Grace and peace to you, my siblings in Christ. The most troubling part of that story for me is that the man born blind has been so disregarded by society, only seen as a beggar on the road, that literally nobody recognizes him when he can see. Maybe a double meaning to this story, don't you think? How Jesus saw a man born blind. 
yet the people don't see who he really is, immediately comes to mind the reformed slave trader John Newton as he wrote in the song Amazing Grace, was blind, but now I see. The man has to become dirty. He has to have his eyes covered in mud to be made clean. And despite the healing, the man gets peppered with all sorts of questions, even questions about why he was born this way in the first place. Can you even imagine having an understanding of God that would assign blame to the sins of parents or grandparents or previous generations for being born blind or disabled or different? You know, I can certainly relate. You know, like it or not, we live in a what-did-you-do-wrong culture. We've certainly felt our share of that. When I first started seminary, Oliver was born, and there were questions about what had happened. Doctors who specifically said, what did you do? Polite inquiries about whether our behavior had contributed to the cause of his disability. It wasn't. Thanks for asking. I had some great conversations with pastors along the way who really helped me kind of sort out my theology and helped me get a better understanding of how God works, especially when things don't necessarily go as planned. These conversations hopefully helped me to become a better husband as I was able to talk with Taryn about my own grief, even though we were processing things in different ways, as we were able to understand what our reality was and what it would become as Oliver would continue to grow. You know, I had people pray for Oliver to have the kind of healing that we witness in the story today. Like, boom, just start, get up and walk around. And to be honest, that was probably even harder to take once we knew that that was never going to be a reality. It almost felt like without being healed in the ways that society looks at being healed, he was just another blind man in the story, that nobody would see him as whole. We've navigated this road for many years before finally getting a a more accurate diagnosis just a few few years ago. He has something called Fox G1. Uh, It was interesting that once we got this diagnosis, we found that there was a support group online, something that might have been helpful for us about 10 years ago. But I noticed on on the page that there's a post at the very top of the group page A helpful reminder for parents who finally are just getting this diagnosis or people who are just starting this journey. And this is the words that they encourage parents with. Parents of newly diagnosed kids, they say, it's going to be okay. Your child is still the same child. Your love for them won't ever change. There will be days that are hard, heartbreaking even. And it's okay to not be okay. Just don't get stuck there. Your child needs you to be strong. When you think you have it hard, just remember, it's harder for your child. So find your tribe. Find those who support you and understand the path that you're walking. Channel your emotions towards this fight, the fight for services, for quality education, for quality of life. Never give up. Always have hope. Your child is going to teach you so much. Oliver's 14, these words are very true. I think about how... Prior to Oliver, maybe I'd seen God's presence and God's blessing in my life, but didn't necessarily perceive how how blessed that was, and I didn't necessarily understand how people might face challenges. There might have been a different mentality that Oliver helped shift in my own world, in my own walk. As I look at Oliver today, This is kind of telling a story of where he's been. I think about how we've had to scratch and claw for the things that he needs. We've had to be his advocate. And even to this day, we still have to beg for services sometimes. But there are acts of incredible kindness and mercy that have been shown to him over these years. There have been acts of amazing grace and amazing love that have been extended to Oliver and to our family. I realized that I had been blind, but now I try to see, whenever I can, what beauty that God has created, especially in those that we often might think God created a little bit different than the norm. I'm afraid that the blindness that we have to the presence of Jesus might be a lot more common than we want to acknowledge. 
When we see others, we see Jesus. And so presence in a worshiping community like the Pharisees in the story, just by being part of that community doesn't guarantee seeing Jesus. They're blind to what he's able to do. One of the most striking features of the story is how even the parents of the man are afraid to praise Jesus or to get pinned down on an explanation of what happened. Now, personally, I'm sure they're thrilled that their son has sight, but they can't tell the Pharisees that. Why not? Well, if they tell the Pharisees he's been healed by Jesus, they'll get kicked out of their worshiping community. If they confess that Jesus has healed their son, the leaders of the church will send them away. Can you imagine a church actually casting out people because of how they've witnessed Jesus? Yet the Pharisees are relentless. They don't or won't see what Jesus has done. They don't give him any credit. Instead, they rip him for healing on the Sabbath. They nitpick on the law instead of lifting up prayers of praise to God. And so when the man gets kicked out of the temple, he's off. He's sent away. Yet Jesus finds him. And they had this conversation. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man in the video had his head down, ashamed. He's just been kicked out of the the synagogue. And so he says, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus says, you've seen him. I am he. And his eyes are open. Lord, I believe. He's cast out, yet the the way that Jesus finds him and his eyes are now open to who Jesus really is, perhaps our eyes can be open to the lengths that Jesus will go to embrace those that the world, yes, sometimes even the church, has cast aside. We have a very important role as the church today. As the church, we bring a voice to neighbors that don't get the benefit of the doubt. As the church, we are the advocates and the allies for those who are oppressed or shunned, for those who have laws targeting their identity. I think about what happens in the church throughout the week. You know, the joke is, you know, the pastor only works one day a week. I guarantee you that the things that are happening throughout the week are ways where God is piercing through and finding ways for us to be able to better serve as a whole congregation. Many people reach out to the church. Some people are looking to the church in hopes of finding sanctuary, maybe a last-ditch effort for some help. Yet I've come to realize in my 10 years as a pastor that the church is not a service agency. We aren't trained or equipped to provide healing, or mental, uh, especially for mental illness or doing things that are going to be able to provide services that other social workers can do. We often get confronted with decisions on ways to help and how to help. Deanna, who's our office manager, is the front door to many of these requests. We've seen a lot together, honestly. Oftentimes, she is able to discern whether or not I need to be pulled in on a certain uh, circumstance. We've learned a few lessons along the way, and she would never, ever, ever point out to me that one time when I uh, was stopped just in time of wiring money to a different state to a person I had never met, but they had said that they needed the money to get back to Forest Lake. She said, are you sure? I stopped just in time, gratefully, because the stories of pain and hurt can tug at our heartstrings. There's this desire to help. And I'm certainly not immune to almost falling for traps or scams, which we verified was indeed absolutely a scam. But what we have learned along the way is that our neighbors can't be helped in isolation. We can't just work at this alone. Much as the advice I got from that parent support group is, we have to find our tribe, partners that aspire to help and to have similar goals. 
One of those partners that we as a church have worked with uh, for many years is Community Helping Hands. Their operations director, Chrissy Lee, is someone that I have talked and texted with many times, but I had never actually met her in person until this week. I wanted to reach out to Chrissy and say, Chrissy, can you tell the story from your side? What is it like to work with Faith Lutheran Church when someone comes into your doors and has needs? I got the sense of how many people tend to walk in and have a story. And people who have a story looking for help. And so what's the best way to be able to provide that help? It's done in partnership. And so Chrissy, she's got a very animated personality that I think you'll appreciate if you haven't met her. Uh, But here is her story. I am Chrissy Lee, and I am the Director of Operations at Community Helping Hand Thrift Store Food Shelf and Financial Aid Programs. Just kind of tell everyone what what kind of relationship you have with Faith Lutheran. Like, how has Faith Lutheran been a partner? I have to get all the giggles out before you record, okay? (laughs) I love Deanna. (laughs) She is just, ooh, I love that girl. The relationship we have is great. Like, a lot of people walk into a church and be like, I need help. Um, and that's where Deanna comes in. It's either a text message or a phone call, or, you know, then we communicate back and forth and we partner and we figure out how faith can assist in the community too, while we're making sure we're helping them with the right resources and not church, just writing out a check and really not knowing where that money is going. We take that and we, you know, make sure it's going, we're helping in the right means. There was a situation, a gal had, you know, some mental health issues, some addiction issues, and was virtually, the story was running from an abusive relationship. Okay. And so that person ended up at Faith store. And, um, you know, there was concerns like how, you know, cause we had Sunday coming and we had church and we had kids and we had all those things coming. And so we had concerns. And so right away we picked her up after hours. We got this girl in a vehicle with a safe driver over to a hotel and we were going to have her stay there. And she was actually, she had applied for jobs. Like she was taking the steps to just stay right here. And so after we got her to the safe spot, then Deanna, we started talking like, how are we going to do this? And so, um, we, we shared the costs of that. We worked it all together. We shared the costs and then, um, in belief, we had that person on the right path and it was, mo- it was month, a couple month path. Addiction is real and addiction can overtake. And unfortunately addiction retook that person. Um, but we still made sure that we got her safely to the next place. One of the other things Faith has been doing has been, uh, you know, we've been bringing in produce over the summer and that's been a real, um, thing that, that we've, taken on mm-hmm. how has how has that been received here it, oh, huge it's really really big so we first use it for the food shelf mm-hmm. and so once it gets to the point where we're getting worried about it then we put it out for the community so everybody whoever is coming in here to shop we posts we tag you know let them know that they're growing when people ask where we get it from we also let them know where we get it from mm-hmm. um so it's a huge thing. It brings in more people, but then it also brings in more stories. And it also brings in, um, like, one of the gals, Deb, who is a volunteer here. And last year she delivered produce because she knows how the store runs, you know. She had many conversations with people about faith and how that whole process works. So it was really nice having her here because I didn't know the in-in, but she could follow through. And it was great. I mean, it, you could tell we were partnered. Um If we didn't have the answer, somebody did for us. Well, we're here. We we always need volunteers. And it's a very fun, fun. Each position is very simple. It is not, there's no hard task to it. And it's however long you can be. Come join us. Bring your ministries here too Mm -hmm. and help us share. Um, I'm glad. I'm very happy to have the relationship I have. And I'm going to speak of Deanna again because I'm really glad I have it. Because she, even when we have these really, really hard things, she enlightens me and she knows that we're doing this together for a good purpose. And so when we're really, we all get stressed out when we have that connection at the end of our really hard conversations, it's just huge to have her on the other end. Yeah. Uh, what a, what a gift for us as a congregation to know that the ways that we're supporting our community are going through a, a valued partner like this. But I want to, I want you to think about your own, your own life. How about you? Who's part of your tribe? Who are the people that you know are a safe place to turn to? 
Think about Faith Lutheran. How is this a safe place? How is this part of your journey? How is faith part of your tribe? Who else can you turn to to help solve problems that come up? Who else in your life helps you make decisions so you know that you're not alone? And then let's think about how is our sight? How are we seeing our neighbors as God's beloved? Are we sometimes guilty of judgment, self-righteousness, ways that make us blind to the humanity of others? We can be stubborn, can't we? We can be like the Pharisees, refusing to acknowledge those that God has created. Yet even when we come up short, there's forgiveness. We are the messy ones. We are the blind. Always, always looking for that opportunity to be able to see. Because Jesus is part of our tribe too. Jesus, always there to lend a helping hand so that we are equipped to lend a helping hand in return. Amen.